<laughs> All right, Romans chapter 5 for tonight, verses 12 through 21. Uh, I am uh, departing from our regular study because I just felt like the Lord laid these verses on my heart. And so I, I uh, you know, everybody's thinking independence, right? Uh, independence and fireworks, because I don't know if you noticed, but I was coming down the coming down Beach Boulevard, I had to get off the beach and go over to Newland because of that. it was just crazy crowded. Oh, yeah. But as I cut over to Newland, there was another uh, fireworks stand there. <laughs> and so that was all crowded out too. So everybody's thinking independence. So I'm calling uh, this teaching tonight, Our Eternal Independence. How's that? Our Eternal Independence, Romans chapter five. So this is a, these are very interesting verses that we're gonna look at. Uh, tonight because they hit on a very fascinating subject. The fascinating subject is the reign of death uh, over humanity. I, I find it very interesting that uh, sometimes you'll hear an argument uh, by atheists and they'll say, oh, well, if there's a God, how come, uh, how come animals eat each other and they attack people and how come there are deformities and on like that? And they're, they're so close and yet so far away. Because the answer to that question is we're living in a fallen world. And we're suffering all the consequences in a fallen world. But it won't always be that way. Christ is going to come back and restore everything. So I think I, I think these I think you're going to like these. Uh, it may sound a little quirky to you, but after I was done with my study, this thought came to me. And the thought that came to me was, if you're going to pick a God to serve, make sure that he has power over death. Right. How does that sound? <laughs> Otherwise, what's the use? So uh, here's a quote from Benjamin Franklin. I know you're all familiar with this. He said, in this world, nothing is certain but what? Taxes. Death and taxes. So I'm not going to talk about taxes tonight, but what does the Bible have to say about death? The book of Romans is the place that we go to when we want to understand the gospel. If you are looking for a subject for the entirety of the Bible, it can be wrapped up in that one word, gospel. The Bible is all about gospel. It's all about salvation. Uh, and the word gospel simply means good news. Anybody need some good news tonight? <laughs> I need some good news. So we go to the word in order to get good news. I went back and forth. Uh, considering possible ways in which to cover these verses because there's a number of approaches that you can take uh, because really in these verses there's like a mystery that's revealed anybody here like mystery novels or mystery movies or who done it well chapter 5 of Romans explains who done it when it comes to death the understanding these verses give to us, again, really cover Genesis 2 through Revelation. And I really want to go at it in a straightforward way. Uh, I want to go at it uh, focused as best as we can. And so let's pray and then let's read a few verses to get us going. Father, I thank you for tonight. I thank you, Lord God, for whom you have drawn here. Because, Holy Spirit, I know you want to teach and reveal the gospel. So, Lord, I ask you to explain these things to us. Lord, you also know the cry of each one of our hearts, those things that are near and dear to us, those things that uh, perhaps have even been weighing on us this day. So, Holy Spirit, use the word to bring truth to our hearts and comfort to our hearts and the knowledge that you love us. We pray these things in Jesus' name, and everybody says, Amen. All right, let's read Romans chapter 5, verses 12 through 17. I'll just read down to 17 as we get started. Uh, the Apostle Paul writes, Therefore, just as through one man sin entered the world, and death through sin, and thus death uh, spread to all men, because all sin... For until the law, sin was in the world, but sin is not imputed where there is no law. <clears throat> Nevertheless, death reigned from Adam to Moses, even over those who had not sinned, according to the likeness of the transgression of Adam, who is a type of him who was to come. But the free gift is not like the offense. 
For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. For the judgment which came from one offense resulted in condemnation, but the free gift which came from many offenses results, resulted in justification. For if by the one man's offense death reigned through the one, much more those who received abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness will reign in life through the one Jesus Christ. Hey, you could be honest. How many does that like cause some confusion? Or at least you look at those verses and you go, I know it's saying something, and I know it's saying something heavy, and I really want to get it, you know. The Lord just kind of help us now and reveal it. The first thing I want to start out by doing is making a claimer, which is different than a disclaimer. <laughs> Here's my claimer. I, I wonder why they don't just call it a claimer. Here's what I claim. I love these verses. They just explain so much about life and about death and why <laughs> death is here. It's just like a, if you're looking through a dirty window, you know, trying to understand this world and trying to have a correct world view. And somebody comes along with these verses and kind of squeegees your front windshield. You go, oh, man, now I can see, you know. That's what these verses do to me. These verses here show us that Jesus, they show us his plan of salvation. They show us God's great love for us. Okay, let me give you an outline then if I can. An easy way to understand these verses. First of all, verses 12, 13, and 14 give to us Adam, of Adam and Eve, and the reign of death. And verses 15 through 21, that's to the end of chapter 5, deal with Jesus and the reign of life. So you have the reign of death, and you have the reign of life. That's really what's going on here. Here's a couple of easy ways also to understand these verses. It's a comparison. That's what these verses are. We're going to take a look at Adam. We're going to see what he's all about, what he brought to the world. And then we're going to take a look at Jesus. What's he all about, and what did he bring to the world? That's what's going on here. The uh, fallout, if you will, from the Adam bomb. Uh, okay. That's not funny. Wow. Okay. Uh, Adam, who bombed out, and the fallout from his disobedience, and then Jesus Christ, his obedience, and the benefits that fall out from his obedience to us. You know, I found that uh, the older you get, the more you uh, consider the weight of death. Not that anybody knows when it will happen or how it will happen, but when you're younger, you know, you look at your life and then you think, oh, well, I've got 40 or 50 or 60 or 70 years, you know, whatever mm -hmm. the case may be, you know. But then you get to a point in your life and you scratch your head and you go, wait a minute, I've, I've got more road behind me than I have in front of me. <laughs> and it's about that time that you, you really start thinking of the gravity of life and the meaning of it. And uh, The sooner that a person does that, really, the better. Uh, Moses prayed a prayer. And Moses' prayer was, Lord, teach me to number my days. Mm -hmm. In other words, don't let anything get away from me as far as what I need to know. Teach me that I am finite and I need to understand these things. Uh, it was Billy Graham who said that the greatest surprise of his life was, and I quote, the brevity of life. It's just in one hot hurry to go by. Everyone dies. It shouldn't come as a surprise to anybody, but guess what? It does. Every time, no matter what the condition of the person, it always comes as a surprise. Anyone who has been to a funeral service knows that something horrible has happened to all of humanity. There is a cry within each one of us that says, this shouldn't be happening. How could this happen? Why did this happen? doesn't matter how young or old you are when you face that thought you realize that death is an enemy and it is not a friend as a matter of fact the Bible calls death itself the last enemy mm -hmm. 
In Psalm 39, verse 5, we learn this. Indeed, Lord, you have made my days as hand breaths. In other words, how long are you going to live? Oh, about that long. <laughs> Just a hand's breath. And my age is nothing before you. Certainly every man at his best, at his best state, is but a vapor. In Proverbs chapter 30, it tells us that the grave is not satisfied, and it never says enough, mm -hmm. does it? Look at verse 12, and let's determine who's being spoken of. So verse 12 says, therefore, just as through one man, okay, this one man here is really important in verse 12. Just as through one man, sin entered the world, and death through sin. And thus death spread to all men because all sin. Here is the who in the who done it. Uh, who in the world opened the door to death? Well, the one man being spoken of here, who sinned and made us all recipients of death, drum roll please, <laughs> is Adam. He sinned, got kicked out of the garden, right? Out of disobedience to the Father. And because we all come from Adam, everybody can be traced back to Adam and Eve. Since we come from Adam and he's fallen and broken, guess what? So are all of we. We're just like a, just like if you did a carbon copy, or carbon copy, who does carbon copies anymore? <laughs> <laughs> I'm really showing how old I am. If you uh, scan a copy and the copy is faulty, then every scan after that will be faulty as well. It inherits it. It inherits the, the flaw. Thank you very much. And so that's all of us. We've inherited, that's a beautiful word, scriptural. We've inherited from Adam that fall, that sin. And the Bible says anybody who sins dies. That's all there is to it. So he disobeyed. He died. We're his descendants. Therefore, death has come into the world. That's the explanation of death. And right here we see that a real salvation, or a real gospel, a real good news, if you will, is desperately needed by mankind. We have to deal with this issue. <laughs> is there anybody who has victory over this thing? In other words, can the one that you choose to follow give an answer for, or an explanation to death? If not, you need to do some re-reasoning. Look at the start of verse 14. There's a phrase that I want us to see. Look at that. Verse 14, it says, Nevertheless, death reigned. And look down at verse uh, 17 for a moment. The first part of it. For if by one man's offense, death reigned. Now, what does that mean to reign? I don't know if you can ever think back to when you were a kid and you played King of the Hill. Anybody here ever played King of the Hill? <laughs> or King of the Bed with your brother or something, you know? king of the hill, then you know that the one who reigns is the one on top, and nobody else can overpower them. That's what that's saying. Uh, the Bible says, for if by one man's offense, death reigned, that means that nobody could overpower death. Uh, death took Adam because of his sin. Death became king. Uh, I have heard death called the great equalizer. Ever heard that terminology before? It's a great equalizer. Uh, all the money in the world. Well, uh, the fellow that uh, that was the uh, head of Apple. I mean, that guy had a lot of money, didn't he? Billions and billions. But that certainly doesn't stop death, does it? It's the great equalizer. When it comes, who can stand against it? Who can be independent, if you will, from death? Our original mom and dad, Adam and Eve, Adam was originally born sinless. He was directly from the hand of God. It says he walked with God. Now look, God is awesomely holy. Awesomely, incredibly, over the top. The Bible uses uh, lots <coughs> of adjectives to explain what God is like. But 
as far as God's holiness is concerned, it's the only uh, expression of God where it's, it just doesn't mention. It says God is love, God is light, God dwells in unapproachable light, oh, uh, God is a healer, uh, you know, uh, God's a redeemer, God's a strong tower, God's a helper. But when it comes to the attribute of holiness, it says God is holy, holy, holy. That's why no sin can exist in the presence of God. He's just absolutely holy. And so uh, this death thing <laughs> gives us a real problem because once you die, then your spirit's with God. And he's holy. And we're not. Wait, let me give you another way to look at it. Uh, you can think of it like this. I'll give, I'll give you two ways. Uh, first of all, how I have been giving it, which is you have a problem. <laughs> Aren't you glad? I went to church and the pastor told me I had a problem. You have a problem. Uh, God's holy and what? We're not. We're not. <laughs> That's a huge problem, especially after death. But uh, here's a problem that God has. Let me tell you what God's problem is. God's holy, and yet he loves you. Now, God cannot divorce himself from his holiness. So if this God who loves you wants you with him, He's got to deal with the sin and death issue in order to have you with him. That's what this whole plan of salvation is all about. That's God's going to solve that problem for both you, your problem, and then God's going to solve his issue of wanting you with him, and yet you being sinful. So uh, the disobedience that Adam had, which by the way these verses say, your sin isn't the same as Adam's, right? Right? You weren't told by God not to eat some precious fruit. But yet you sin anyway. Mm -hmm. It was called the bite. That bite of fruit was called the bite that was felt around the world. <laughs> Absolutely it was. So she ate, he ate, they died. Oh, not physically at first. The death that they experienced was a separation from God. And ultimately that is the definition of death. Separation from God. Why a Christian can be at peace when they're going to die is because they know at no time will they ever be separated from God. How do we know this? We put faith in Jesus who said, I will never leave you and I will never forsake you. And at the point of your death, you get an angelic escort and Jesus says to the Father, that one's mine. This is take the weight off of, off of uh, death, you know. Man. Jesus sure does it, doesn't he? That's pretty, that's pretty radical. So, every descendant of Adam and Eve are born spiritually dead and then eventually die physically. Mm -hmm. We end up with his fallen DNA. We end up with the sickness of sin. We all sin. We're all born to be wild, full of pride, disobedient, a desire to please self rather than please God. It's almost a shock to us, or it is a shock to us, when we first find out God loves us, we go, what? Why? <laughs> Why? <laughs> How? Are you serious? <laughs> it's an amazing thing. And the Bible teaches again that the wages of sin is death. Now, lest you get angry at Adam and think that you would have done a better job, let's test it out right now. Okay, everybody here? Get on your mark, get set, stop sinning. Ever again. I, how do you think you'll do? Horrible. You think you'll make it to next Sunday? <laughs> think you'll make it to the parking lot? <laughs> we have a, our problem is sin. It's like McGee says. McGee, uh, you know, he's a great guy. He he, uh, he uh, taught that uh, he says uh, the only thing that separates us from God is sin. That's it. That's the big thing. That's the hurdle. That's what we got to solve here. All right, who's ready for some good news? Here, here comes some good news. Jesus Christ paid for your sin. He looked at your sin. He knows your sin. You're no surprise to him. He's seen you backward, forward, upside down, every imaginable way. He still loves you. Again, why? <laughs> because God is love. That's why he loves us. Not because we're lovable, but because he is love. He saw the price of your sin, and he was willing to pay it. He conquered death. How could he conquer death? 
He never sinned. The wages of sin is death. Jesus never sinned. Therefore, he never had to die. Well, he did die. Well, why did he die? Because he died in your place. That's the gospel. I mean, it's as simple as that. A child can understand that, you know? But that's the awesomeness of the gospel at the same time. Look at verse 15. But the free gift is not like the offense. What, the argument that he's going to give here is he's going to try and build a case that says that the gift of salvation or the gift of heaven or the gift of Christ is so much greater in comparison to the awfulness of the sin of Adam. Here's how he does it. For if by the one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. And the gift is not like that which came through the one who sinned. Mm -hmm. For the judgment which came from the one offense resulted in condemnation. In other words, everybody got condemned. Do you know that in John chapter 1, Jesus says, I did not come to condemn? Mm -hmm. Isn't that cool? That's why everybody feels so free about around Jesus, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> it says uh, Jesus was a friend of sinners. He was a friend of sinners because he never came to condemn anybody. But you have to ask the question, why did Jesus not condemn anybody? Because we're all already on death row. Do, do you get it? <laughs> He doesn't need to condemn anybody. We're already condemned. We got condemned how? By being descendants of Adam. Mm -hmm. So Jesus goes to the jail, or for me, I like to say he goes to the dog pound. I'm just one of his rescue pups. Believe me. It's like the Lord saw me, you know. <laughs> you know, he took pity on me. You know what that's like. And then, uh, but Jesus also said, to whom... Uh, the one who is forgiven much, what? No, no, no. The one who is forgiven much, loves much. And how are, how are rescue dogs? They know who pulled them out of there, don't they? Boy, we, should be, we should be as honorable towards God as, as our pets are towards us. Oh, my gosh. That would be wild, wouldn't it? Yeah. Oh Lord, oh Lord, you're here. What do you want us to do? You know, <laughs> let's go. You know, we're gonna go someplace. Let's go. Instead of, oh, where's he gonna drag me to now? What's he gonna do with my life? You know. All right, that was, uh, that was totally off subject. And uh, let me read those same verses in the Amplified Bible and see if they help us out tonight. Because this, this is this is the, the you could say. That this chapter, well, I would say five and six, but w what we're looking at tonight is like, is like the entirety of the Bible uh, condensed down to a few verses. You know, I mean, this is everything. This is our worldview. This is Christianity. You know, this is the. You just like it's like you know the Lord just scrunched it down and gives it to us here so clear. I'm reading from the Amplified Bible. It says, But God's free gift is not at all to be compared to the trespass. His grace is all is out of all proportion to the fall of man. For if many died through one man's falling away, his lapse, his offense, that's Adam, much more profusely did God's grace and the free gift that comes through the undeserved, unmerited favor of the one man, Jesus Christ, abound and overflow to and for the benefit of many. And that's, that's just great. That's why people like me can stand in front of whoever, and you can stand in front of whoever, and you can say to them, it doesn't matter what you've done or where you've been or what you've thought or how you've sinned, or if you think you don't measure up, you don't. But God so loves you, what, that He gave His only begotten Son, that whoever believes in Him might not perish. Well, let's go back to the dog pound again. Don't they put a date on there? Because you, you do rescue dogs. And, and you have to pull that dog out before the date, or else that's it for the dog. Well, look, that's our lives. 
we, we all have an expiration date. We don't know when it is. And, uh, you know, regardless of whether you're a person on time or always late, that's the one appointment you will be on time for. <laughs> you will not miss that date. <laughs> the, point, the thing is to get rescued by Christ uh, uh, before that date. Now, you don't, you don't have to beg him to do that because he already did it because he loves you. And so that's why you can freely offer the gift of salvation to anybody. It doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. Whether you're speaking to somebody who is literally on death row in prison for whatever it is they did, or somebody who feels as though they've been good all their lives, and you need to tell them your goodness is not good enough to measure up to the holiness of God because you're already in the cage of death because you're a descendant of Adam. Is everybody with me on this? Yeah. This, this is it, folks. This is salvation. It, it, it goes on in the, in the Amplified Bible. Nor is the free gift at all to be compared to the effect of that one man's sin. For the sentence following the trespass of one man brought condemnation, whereas the free gift following the many transgressions, all of our sins, brings justification. And that word justify, uh, you know, the uh, doctrine of justification, if you will. Uh, but the word justify c means what? Just as if I never sinned. I'm justified. Just as if I'd never sinned. It would be like this. It would be like uh, uh, going to, uh, having done something, a speeding ticket or whatever and uh, you go to your court date and uh, they, you're on the docket and they call your name and you, you stand there and uh, the judge says uh, you know uh, bring me the file on this person and the, and the, the terrible thing they did and uh, <coughs> the uh, court clerk says I, there's no file there's no file on them the judge says, what do you mean? What are they doing here? Aren't, didn't they, isn't there some offense? No, 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 the, everybody look, <laughs> find it, put it up on the computer. They type in your name and there's nothing there. Well, that's how it is when you stand before God. How awesome is that? Even when we condemn, uh, Romans chapter eight says, even if you condemn, even if your own heart condemns you, and don't, don't our hearts condemn us sometimes? Yeah, okay. Me too. <laughs> it says, even if your own heart condemns you, what? God is greater than your heart. So you can go to God after Christ has paid the price for your sins, and you say to God, oh, Lord, the terrible thing I did. And God goes, well, I'm sorry, there's no records here of that. Cool. You're my son. You're my daughter. I love you. Now, come on. Walk after my son, Jesus. Live as though he's calling you to live. That, that, oh my gosh, doesn't that just touch your heart? Mm -hmm. Amen. So 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 53 to 55, 1 Corinthians 15, a familiar a passage to many of us. Here's the further worldview for you, the explanation of death and life. For this corruptible, <laughs> that's uh, our bodies, 